And then we move on to chapter 4 and verse 1. And when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they began to oppose. And that whole chapter is a chapter of opposition. Opposition. I want you to notice one thing. These people had already come back from Jerusalem and as we saw in chapter 3 verse 8 that it was only in the second year of their coming that they began to build. For two years they had been there, at least for one year or more. They had built their houses. They had started gathering material we see in chapter 3 verse 7 for the foundation. And they gathered and they started building the foundation and you know the foundation for that temple couldn't have been built in one day. It took quite some time, probably weeks and months to build the foundation and the enemies never did a thing. But now that the foundation was completed and they were beginning to build the superstructure, then we read about the enemies. Then we read about the opposition. And that's exactly like that today. You can preach about repentance, faith, water baptism, baptism in the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts and resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment and the enemies don't disturb you. But you go beyond that to build a superstructure. You go beyond that to preach about perfection, about Jesus coming in the flesh, being made perfect, the type of things that Paul writes in Hebrews 5 and Hebrews 6. And there, these enemies are coming out of everywhere all of a sudden. Now that shouldn't discourage us if we have studied the book of Ezra. We say, well, we're in the pattern. It's exactly like that. It's written there. That it, in fact, we can almost predict that this is going to happen if you have studied the book of Ezra beforehand. And the enemies, they never oppose the foundation. What they oppose is the teaching of discipleship, the teaching of perfection, the teaching of Christ coming in the flesh and the rent veil about Jesus being a forerunner and about the one body and the one new man. That's what the enemies oppose. That's what Satan opposes. That's what the evil spirits oppose. And that's what many blind Christians who are unconsciously agents of Satan oppose. And so these enemies approach Zerubbabel. Now I want you to notice here how these people approached very subtly. They said, let's build with you for we like you seek your God. We've been sacrificing to him since the days of Ezra had on king of Assyria who brought us up here. I want to tell you who these people are. These people are sort of uh, half-breeds, we can say. You know, I told you that the nation of Israel was split up into two. Ten tribes became the northern kingdom of Israel. Two tribes became the southern kingdom of Judah. And the ten northern tribes were taken away by the king of Assyria. More than a hundred years before the Nebuchadnezzar took the southern kingdom captive, the king of Assyria took the northern kingdom captive. But do you know what the king of Assyria did? I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 17. This is in the northern kingdom. The king of Assyria, uh, after he took away these ten tribes captive, he did something. 2 Kings 17.24 he brought men from Babylon, from Kutat, Ava, Hamat, Sepharvaim, heathen people, and settled them in the cities of Samaria. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, of the ten tribes, in place of the sons of Israel. I don't know why he did that, but he sort of uh, tried to integrate these other people with the Jews and mixed marriages and all that, and put these people there. And they probably got married to the Jewish girls there and all that. And they sort of became half-breeds and they possessed Samaria and lived in its cities. And it says about these people in verse 33, they feared the Lord but served their own gods. That's a perfect picture of compromise. They feared the Lord and served their own gods. And there are many people like that today who fear the Lord and serve their own gods. They come, they fear the Lord, they say, but they live for money and for honor and things like that. And these were the people from whom descended the Samaritans. They lived in Samaria. That's why you read in John chapter 4 that the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Because they said these Samaritans are half-breeds. They're not really Jews. And so it's these Samaritans who came, these compromisers, these half-breeds, who feared the Lord and served their own gods, 
who came to Zerubbabel in Ezra 4 verse 2. And they said, let's also build with you. You see, that's the first scheme of Satan. Let's, we're all brothers. We're all believers. We all believe in Jesus. We all praise the Lord. Let's all, let's build with you. Let's have a great big ecumenical movement. For we, like you, seek your God. He said, we seek your God. Because we've also been sacrificing to the true God since the days of the king of Assyria who brought us up here. They weren't really, they're not really wholehearted people who want to follow the Lord. They are the people who fear the Lord and serve their own gods. And that is the first approach of Satan through ecumenical cooperation. Now, uh, I want you to notice here five methods by which these enemies tried to hinder God's work. Five methods by which Satan tries to hinder God's work today. Number one, ecumenical cooperation. But Zerubbabel and Joshua had wisdom. And the rest of the heads of Israel, they said to them, You have nothing in common with us. Sorry. That looks a bit uh, ungracious, you know. It's not nice to talk to people like that. When people are wanting to come and help you to do God's work. And you say, sorry, nothing doing. You've got nothing to do with us in building a house to our God. But we ourselves will build it. We are few, but we are enough. We don't want you. And that's the thing that provokes the enemy. When you say to them, sorry, we are a bit exclusive, you know. We have certain standards. We believe you must be born again. We believe you've got to be a disciple. We believe you've got to obey the Lord in water baptism. We believe you've got to leave these dead denominations. They say, no, we also believe in Jesus. You think we are some type of heathen worshipping idols? No, we believe in Jesus. And that's... Uh, it's at that place where the devil comes and pollutes God's work. And Zerubbabel and Joshua had wisdom. Number two, when they didn't succeed in ecumenical cooperation, the second method is discouragement. Then the people of the land, verse 4, discouraged the people. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you, you'll never do anything. It's impossible. You people trying to start something and try to have a pure testimony. Uh, so many people have tried like that and they always split up after a few years. And they always have fights and quarrels and discourage them. Like that, it's, it's the same old story. Discouragement. If Satan can't get us to cooperate with compromises, the next thing he'll do is discourage us. Look at, the, um, look at these so-called wholehearted brothers and sisters you're sitting with. And discourage us by various things, various weaknesses he tries to show us in one another. And if he doesn't succeed there in discouragement, then he tries to frighten us. The last part of verse 4. To frighten. They frighten them and harass them. And that's the other method of the devil. To frighten God's people. And to terrify them. You won't be able to be married decently if you join that group. Or have a decent funeral. or so It's, it's any odd little thing like that which the devil can pick up. And put fear into people's hearts. If you go there you're going to lose this. You won't get that scholarship there. Or you won't get the admission here. Or some free treatment there in the hospital or whatever it is. It's amazing the number of things the devil's got up his sleeve to frighten people with, to prevent them from wholeheartedly obeying God and doing his will. You lose, you lose your business if you do things like this. Frighten them. Now, and if only people would believe one word of God, one word, you don't need two. 1 Samuel 2.30, which God says, Them that honor me, I will honor. I tell you, you can take that one verse and go all through life and overcome every uh, fear that the devil tries to put upon us in silly fears. Them that honor me, I will honor. And then, number four, turn people against us. That's the next trick of the devil. First, ecumenical cooperation. Second, discouragement. Third, fear and harassment. Fourth, turn people against us. Verse five, they hired counselors. These are the gundas of those days. To, <laughs> they hired them to frustrate their counsel and hinder these people from doing God's work. Turn people against us. There are respectable gundas and there are uncouth gundas. In, in, when the people oppose us, they don't all oppose us with sticks and stones. There are very subtle ways in which some of these sophisticated gundas also behave. In hindering, trying to hinder... God's work. Hired counselors to frustrate God's work. Even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And then finally, fifth, governmental obstruction. 
all these things didn't succeed, then they put government pressure to try and hinder the building of God's house. They wrote, it says in verse 6, in the reign of Assyrius, they wrote an accusation in the days of Artaxerxes. And uh, they wrote a big accusation there, a letter saying that this is from so-and-so. We are writing to you, your servants, verse 11, let it be known, O king, these Jews have come, verse 12, to build Jerusalem. They are rebuilding the rebellious and evil city. And they are finishing the walls, which is an absolute lie. Because they hadn't even started on the walls. It's amazing how the devil gets people to tell lies against us, all to hinder God's work. And the wonderful thing we see in it all is finally how God's purposes are furthered. But that we'll see in our next study. But the thing I want you to notice here is that God permits this opposition. He could have stopped it. He could have killed those enemies. But he didn't do it. He permitted that opposition. He permitted them to write the letter. He permitted the king to reply to that letter. And to say, yes, we have read this letter the king wrote in verse 17 onwards. And said, please, now uh, we are now going to stop these men from working. Verse 21. Issue a decree to make these men stop work. So that the city is not rebuilt. Why did God permit this opposition? To test his people. To see whether they are wholehearted enough to overcome the enemy at each point. I just want to say in the building of God's house, God permits opposition. He permits the temptation to compromise. Discouragement. Fear. Turning people against us. Governmental obstruction. All types of things. But God wants us to overcome every one of them and move forward.